Welcome, friends, to the Enduring Gifts of Marvin Gaye podcast. Brought to you by your 26-year listening veteran, Jessica. Join me as we celebrate these enduring gifts, the songs of Marvin Gaye. In each episode, I will share insights about the music and recount life experiences tied to it. I'm hoping to inspire you to take a first or your 500 first listen to these songs that are truly the enduring gifts of Marvin Gaye. Episode The Shadow of Your Smile. This is an episode that I um, highlighted, previewed, shouted out that I was going to record, um, I believe, in the My Last Chance episode. Um, It is a song, the version of the song is from the Marvin Gaye collection. So, you know, I'm still in the Marvin Gaye collection, the sequence of of my music absorption of Marvin by this point in time. I'm still 14. I'm still up in North Dakota um, on this three-week trip I had taken up on the summer vacation where I have been exposed to this box set. And... Um, I am now on a different disc than I have discussed so far, which is disc four of the collection. I'm looking at the book right now. I'm actually on Rare Live and Unreleased, volume three. Um, Okay, so now at page 24 of the book, we're at the Balladeer section. And it's actually showing pictures of Marvin, and it's a very young Marvin. And... Okay, then I flipped the page, and it's an older Marvin. It's a 1980s Marvin. And that's an interesting arc right there, just in itself, the story that two pages of pictures told. It is the fact that Marvin Gaye desired to be a balladeer from jump in his career, from the very beginning, through to he never let go of that vision of wanting to perfect that music to the end of his career. Um, And so I mentioned that briefly before, that Marvin had segments of his career. He had different visions of what he wanted to do artistically with his music. And... um. Let's put it in context. Let's go to the 60s when Marvin's career is first starting out. Uh, Of all places that he could have been a recording artist, uh, and at the time that he could have been a recording artist, he's at Motown Records, right? Which is just in its infancy. It's just beginning. And it's just this beginning of a musical revolution uh, that's going on in the United States and then worldwide because Motown artists and Motown songs are worldwide hits. It's not just something that, you know, America owns and, and, you know, is the only one that can appreciate. So, but that's a very distinctive sound, right? It, it literally is the Motown sound. And it was just the music that was being created at that time. If you look across the board, we're talking early 1960s, it's pop. It's kind of like um, probably the hardest dawning of pop music. You know what I mean? Where it's kind of this deviation from maybe what mainstream music has been all along where it's very youth focused um like and and what's very popular is very much focused at that teenage demographic now actually when i said that i'm my mind is in the 1940s and 
you know, I'm thinking of the big band sounds and, and that type of thing, but actually that music was very popular with the youth of that age, that era. So, you know, it was the teenagers of the 1940s that were, you know, gobbling up that music. So I, that probably is the definition of pop music, probably just across the board, no matter what decade you're in. It's the music that appeals to the youth, right? It's just that really light, nothing deep, not a really deep message, um, and just something to kind of play at your party in the background, right? So that is the organization that Marvin stepped into at the immediate beginning of being signed to a record label, right? Um, he has been traveling um performing in the moon glows and oh my gosh i just heard a moon glows song earlier this afternoon as i've mentioned i'm over on to spotify now for my streaming um daily consumption of marvin and that was some material that i had an opportunity to hear for the first time uh these recordings of marvin pre motown pre being you know officially record label signed uh, traveling the country. And I don't know how far across the country they actually went, but traveling with Harvey Fuqua, um, you know, Harvey picked them up in, in Washington, DC, where Marvin grew up and, and was raised. And from there, they embarked out on tour because the, the Moon Glows was Harvey Fuqua's band. And he just kind of rotated in his, uh, doo -woppers. It was a doo -wop group. So it was, that was definitely appealing to the youth of the now 50s, right? And it was late 50s. Um, but that whole genre of doo-wop, right? Like Marvin got in to the music business into doo-wop. And that's an actually a very telling beginning. That actually can kind of help keep that context associated with Marvin from the very beginning through to the very end. Marvin never lets go of the form of doo-wop. And I hope that I'll remember to kind of dive a little deeper into this later on. You know what? I have a feeling I would forget, so I'm going to speak to it right now. When I say to keep it in mind that Marvin never lets go of the form of doo-wop, what I mean by that is that let's let's fast forward now to this next page in the book that I'm looking at and it's it's this beautiful picture. I'm actually surprised I haven't taken this picture out of this book and have it hanging on my wall. Um, <laughs> it's a picture of Marvin. Uh, you can tell it's 1980s. Um, he, he looks great though. He looks really healthy and he's uh, holding a microphone, wearing this nice black jacket and a white crisp shirt underneath. He's got a white um, pocket patch and white pants, and he just looks very sharp. But the way through to this end portion of Marvin's career, and only ending because his life ended, he still constantly relied on the form of doo-wop in that Marvin was his own personal doo-wop quartet, cinquets, whatever, sextet, you know, whatever, however many number of people are making up the different um, levels. Because, And I'm not a musician, right? So as I'm going to be speaking to you about these things, you're not going to hear me referring to things musically, technically correct, right? I don't know what a this and that is elements of music, but I know Marvin's music and I know the way that he kind of went about giving me the sounds of his music. So I can definitely tell you about the different sounds of Marvin's music. Marvin made his multiple multi-layered harmonies approaching each layer that he created and blended in of himself into his music coming at it as the doo-wop format. So Marvin would sing this level, right? Then Marvin would come in and he would sing 
the next level. And then Marvin would come in and he would sing the third level, the fourth level, the fifth level. He would sing every single individual part that at the same time, a doo-wop group is singing in harmony, right? Marvin always harmonized with himself. Now he, he dove deep into doing that once he took full control of his career in the seventies. Um, what's going on is where he breaks those chains and he's like, F it. I've got full control of the sounds that I'm making point blank period. Nobody else is producing my music. So, and then once he was there and he just really had it all in hand, he just, went all the way in. And what he began doing, like, and from that point forward, all the time, um, was multi layering himself into his music. Um, And as I said, just coming in at each. So and here's some terms that I know, right? It's like the alto, it's the tenor, it's the bass, it's the blah, da, 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 right? It's each one of those. If you are trying out for the choir, right? And you just, they have you sing a little part of the song. They can tell the register that your voice best fits into. Well, here was the absolutely freaking superhuman thing about Marvin is that his voice fit seamlessly, perfectly into so many different registers, right? I, I saw something recently. I, it was, I've been doing so much, um, searching for Marvin, um, gay material, mostly images and stuff. But as I'm searching for those things, I'll come across, uh, websites that, you know, have some type of a full on article going on along with these multiple pictures. And so something that I saw recently said he had the, a four octave range, right? And I know that I did learn how to play the piano very beginner level at this exact same age when I was starting to uh, learn Marvin's music I was taking piano lessons every weekend and so I do know the different octaves right it's lower until it gets to the higher that's like the low pitch to the high pitch of the the sound so Marvin had a pitch perfect though you know and I wouldn't I would be surprised if it was actually limited to four uh, he, I think if you would listen to Mar- Marvin can like sing the, the scales of the piano, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, so, uh, but they said he had a four and four octave range. And what I know if they're saying that and they're attributing that to him, I, this is what I can guarantee you pitch perfect in every single register. Like, it's like, what do you need him to sing? And how do you need him to sound singing it? He's going to hit it right there for you. Take is done. You know what I mean? So it's not a problem. He's got you covered. He's got himself covered. And he's always creating these multiple layers of himself that then come in and they, on the back end, they get blended in and they get layered in. And so then what you're ending up hearing is Marvin just as the choir? He is his own choir. The single most gift from heaven example of that is on a double disc, like re release, special edition, you know, reissue. They always are doing, Motown is doing these re release issues of, of the albums. Um, not, not probably not so much anymore, but, uh, where it's the studio version that was released plus now all of the unreleased, all of the studio sessions, the stuff that didn't make it to the album, Marvin's drafts, right? And so there, and I don't remember, it was in the late nineties that this one came out, um, of I want you, the album I want you. Um, it is the studio session take of him singing, um, track number nine, which is dreamed of you this morning, then came the dawn. What the hell is the name of that song? (laughs) Soon I'll be loving you. Soon I'll be loving you. 
It's the studio version of that, the unreleased version of that. And at the very end of the track, so like the, the song is done and it, it kind of has ended and there's silence, but then they bring in just do, 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 do. And I, of course, the, what, ha, what is the motto, folks? Only Marvin will do. Okay, so I'm not, I just did absolutely no service to that. But it's, it's at the end of that track where it, it glides in. It plays you this little, I don't know how long is it, 15, 20 seconds of an example of Marvin singing himself. You know what I'm saying? He's just singing every single layer and level of of the music and it is a sound from heaven. That's just the only way to describe it. So you got to hear that, but that's doo-wop. That's the form of doo-wop. That's where Marvin started singing his part in a song. And so let me go to this song that I heard today from the moon glows 12 months of the year. It was called, and I'm so sorry, <laughs> but it's, uh, <laughs> It was being led sung by someone, not Marvin. And it was just like, oh my God, how in the hell is it possible that you had Marvin Gaye in your group <laughs> and you guys are recording something and you don't have Marvin singing the lead because, you know, I love my man that was doing it. But um, yeah, no, <laughs> it's not Marvin singing the lead and i'm i'm listening to it i'm trying to distinguish like in the the harmony which one is marvin there i think i can hear him but it's so blended in you know it's it's not crystal clear i can tell there is a part at, at towards the end of the song where it's almost it's more of speaking and i can tell that that's marvin speaking um, but it's definitely not Marvin singing the lead. And so that was kind of a mess. Uh, but you know, if I, Marvin was saying the lead on every single thing that they did. And, and that's just, that wasn't, um, what they went with. So, um, the shadow of your smile, right? That is the title of this episode. And it is on disc four, track 15 of The Balladeer. Now, and you know what? I want to just explain the, my intention kind of of ever recording these episodes. I'm not, and I, so I, I, I do not care about giving you the Wikipedia versions of trivia about Marvin Gaye. That's not what this is about. This is about the music, the sound, the content, the, and that is what I can give you back in my head. I don't need to have, you know, the computer, the internet pulled up for me to be able to give you facts, figures, and dates, and, you know, that type of thing. I'm not doing that with this. But, um, so the shadow of your smile. It's track 15, I believe. Uh, it again, I can tell it is the third track from the end of that disc. And so that disc is, is segmented as well. Um, Marvin Gaye, when he very first began to record with Motown, had this vision balladeer. He wanted to sing jazz crooner balladeer type of songs he was trying to kind of bypass uh doo-wop which was kind of on its way out and pop which was being given to you and and that time culture was very segmented so it was considered in like a black way or a white way right and so motown had the um kind of monopoly on the black pop sound. And then, you know, the the white pop sound is just anything else that was going on huge mainstream at that time, right? But um Marvin when he first was coming onto the scene, he didn't he wasn't about that. That was not what he was trying to do. There was an interview that I saw Barry Gordy giving one time. So in in some 
form. I, I'm watching Barry Gordy um, speaking about his encounter with Marvin Gaye, uh, kind of, I think, pre-signing him or like he has signed him, but they haven't released anything yet. So very early on, it, it was very much Barry still not knowing who Marvin is as a person, you know, and he's, he's a, hey, you don't know me like that. You know what I mean? Barry didn't know Marvin like that yet. And so Barry was saying that there was some type of a party. I believe it was a Christmas party that was going on. And so I, I they were at Motown. So, but I don't know if he had signed Marvin yet. And Marvin was at this party and he was sitting at the piano. So this, it was a party was going on around Marvin and Marvin was not so much interacting with the party, but he was sitting at a piano and he was just tinkering around. He was playing his own original material. You know, he's just playing around on the piano and up comes Barry Gordy up on Marvin and took it upon himself to want to start offering some constructive suggestions of oh, you could do this with that, or you could make it sound like that. <laughs> Marvin just kind of gave Barry a look and a vibe that I know was looks and the vibe that remained between Marvin and Barry for the rest of Marvin's career working with Barry. And Barry said he could totally tell he he just understood when he when he got that look and that vibe from Marvin that Marvin didn't require the input. <laughs> you know what I mean? He didn't um it wasn't necessary. It was, it was, and it was probably not going to be processed. So it's like, you know, thanks for the suggestion or whatever, but, um, I'm making this sound right now. And so I'm going to get back to doing that. Thanks. You know, and so I know that Barry Gordy really struggled with trying to have his hand, um, on Marvin's music a lot more than, thank God Marvin allowed him to from beginning uh, to end. And um, so when Marvin is now signed and he first comes into Motown, he's got this vision of the sounds that he wants to make. And I think, you know, in his mind, he's looking at it as he has a record deal now. So he gets to get into the studio, right. And he gets to have access to musicians and, um, but like, let's get some pieces in here. You know what I mean? Like I need strings and I need, uh, horns and I need, you know, just, I need to have the musicians in here that I need to create the sound that I need. I don't need just the little drummer, which Marvin was a percussionist. And I, that, that is such an important thing. I want to point that out right now too, because that's going to play out in several ways throughout Marvin's career. But, you know, Marvin was the percussionist, the Motown percussionist early days, uh, very beginning Motown songs. Marvin is the guy playing the drums on those songs. Okay. So Marvin was a percussionist, but Marvin didn't just require that little kind of like four piece, you know, I got, I've got, I've got you covered on the drums cause I'm playing the drums and you got my bass player and a guitar player and a keyboardist, right? Like I need more than that. I'm making more sound than that. I'm going more sophisticated than that. I'm doing, um, more than that. And so he, uh, created albums. I believe it's going to be his first two albums. Hold on. Let me look here. Cause I have access to my chronology, um, where that's what he did. Okay. Marvin is not giving you his first couple of albums that, okay. So yes, the very first album is the Soulful Moods of Marvin Gaye, 1961. And that is the balladeer. That's Marvin being the balladeer. That's not Marvin being Motown sound. Um, do, 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 bow. You know, he's no, no, that's not, you don't hear that on that album. And so that's Marvin Gaye's very first recorded album, his first access to the studio, his first, I'm making my sound. That's what he gave Motown. And you know that Motown didn't want that. Um, and I know that it was a Marvin kind of had to put his foot down to get that album made. 
and be the first thing that he released. And so then, hold on, because the second album is 1963. It's showing me her. January of 1963. The first one comes out June of 61. And that stubborn kind of fella comes out in January of 63. So it was a most definite Motown gave in. The first album was created. It was created to the specifications that Marvin had in mind. And I already explained this. It wasn't a commercial success. Marvin was coming in wanting to approach that music at the end times of the cycle of that genre of music. And I have explained there were already the legends. There was already the Nat King Cole, the Frank Sinatra. In my opinion, those are the two pinnacles of that genre of music, just as far as vocal ability, just as far as, you know, iconic status and yeah. And then, but then there are so many knockoffs, if you will, of the two of them. And I don't mean that as disrespect necessarily, but I have a very, very strong opinion of Frank Sinatra. It's just like, yes, please. I, and I, here's something that I, um, noted a a couple of years ago Uh, there a couple of years back I was once again I was deciding to dabble into Frank Sinatra because it was just like you know what I know that I love Frank Sinatra so much um because I love him as an actor actually um very very into classic movies and just an FYI and heads up uh that will be a totally um separate podcast that I will be um, diving into at some point is just totally discussing classic films. Um, and I love Frank Sinatra as an actor. Um, and he was doing it in the fifties and six forties, fifties, sixties. And, um, so I know his music from like movies, but I knew that I had never explored him because I've been exploring Marvin for 26 years. There's not a whole lot of time for deep dive exploration for a whole bunch of everybody else. You know, it, it kind of reminds me about that movie Friday where <laughs> Smokey is telling the girl, he's like, you know, my mama don't like a whole lot of people in the car. You know, I, I don't have time for like a whole lot of people in my um, playlist. Okay. But <laughs> it's the and I do want to make it very clear though. Like I do have a, a varied playlist uh, and I do know well the music of people be on Marvin, but, um, it takes a lot for me to want to do that. Right. And so, but without question, Frank Sinatra is like a heck yes, let's do this. So a couple of years back, I'm deciding to start to listen to Frank Sinatra. And the way that I kind of went about it is I was listening to, oh gosh, what is, there's like an online little radio station thing, right? Uh, where you'll go in and you type in Marvin Gaye, right? And then it's going to create a radio station for you around that artist, but you're in no control of it. You don't get to say what song is coming next. Next, and you um, kind of have multiple skips. So I created a Frank Sinatra radio station. But let me just, okay, hold on. Before I go into that, so this this evolution of music, right? This evolution of things becoming on demand, because we've already talked about where the struggle used to be real, okay? And, but way back in the day when this shit like first started to become on demand, I had this online radio station that I created. Uh, I forget what the platform was. They definitely don't have it anymore, but it was every single thing. And this is exactly what I'm talking about. And it wasn't Napster. It was legal. It was this online radio station thing where you could go in, I could go in and I could make a Marvin Gaye radio station. And then it's going to start to blend me in songs. But on each and every song that would come on, I had full control to say, play this song all the time. So then they would really play that specific song, like a lot on my radio station. And I could go in and customize every single song that they would try and throw into my loop and decide, eh, no, I don't ever want it. So that I could say, don't ever play me that song again. Oh my gosh, that I had my stuff hooked up. So just I was grooving on that all the time. It was sounding just exactly right. But then it kind of went away from that type of total control 
uh, service to uh, what it Pandora, right? It's Pandora that it is nowadays where you can't customize it per song like that. And you really kind of can't control that. You know, I, I want a Frank Sinatra radio station, but damn, could you just only play me Frank Sinatra? Because when it comes to Frank Sinatra's voice, like he is the most definite knockoff, right? There's no knockoffs to Nat King Cole. Nat King Cole only sounds like Nat King Cole. There's nobody else that comes anywhere near sounding like Nat King Cole. But everybody tried to sound like Frank Sinatra. And I just, I don't like it. I don't like it when I hear somebody that I, I will give them a couple of seconds of listening time because I at first, I can't tell whether or not it's Frank Sinatra. That annoys the hell out of me. So one day, I'm listening to my Frank Sinatra radio station. It's one of these same examples of I'm in the office, exact same office. I have stepped away for a few minutes, left Pandora playing. I come back. I put in my headphones. And there's a song playing, but this is a Frank Sinatra song. Oh my gosh, he did it with Duke Ellington. And that's the reason why. This is a Frank Sinatra song that has so much groove that's going on with it. So I come in and I'm listening to it and it's just groove. It was just in groove. There was no vocal yet. So I'm listening to this song and I was just like, what? the hell is this? Because it is just giving me groove life, dude. It is just the cleanest, funkiest groove going on right now. And I'm like, who in the world is this? And then so a little bit later, the vocal starts to come in and I'm sitting there and I'm listening to it. And now I've gone beyond those couple of seconds and I'm almost kind of pissed off because I'm like, okay, this song is sounding so freaking good right now. And I was like, and it sounds like Frank Sinatra, but I can't tell if it's Frank Sinatra, right? Because that's what I'm saying. All of these little knockoff guys that always tried to sound like Frank Sinatra, you can't tell who the hell they are until you look and you get their name. And then you're like, oh, it's just whoever this person is that was trying to sound like Frank Sinatra. That is not Frank Sinatra. And therefore, I don't need to know who that person is because it's not Frank Frank Sinatra. So I thought I was kind of encountering a situation like that. And why I was kind of pissed off about that is because I was enjoying it so much, right? So this was probably going to be about the first time that that could have possibly been a knockoff that I was hooked. I was into it. So I stopped what I was doing and I looked at it and it was Frank Sinatra and Duke Ellington. And they made an album together. And oh my goodness, yes. Okay. So props to it, props up, props to Sinatra, props to Nat King Cole. They mastered it. They had it. They did the thing. And the thing was pretty much, you know, on its way out. It was cycling out. It was being um, just kind of replaced, right? In music, it, it happens like that. And that's no negative thing necessarily. It just evolves, right? And so music was evolving from that point in time. But, you know, also you could totally understand here comes Marvin. And so, yeah, Nat King Cole, a total idol for Marvin. Um, Frank Sinatra, I don't know. I didn't really ever encounter Marvin like specifically saying that, but it's not possible that, you know, he probably was somebody that had much respect. So Marvin's coming in and he's wanting to do that. You know what I mean? And maybe Marvin wasn't really like accepting that the music was done and he just maybe wanted to, to keep it going, like freshen it up, you know? And so he recorded his very first album he recorded is the soulful moods of Marvin Gaye. And what he's giving us is nothing really original. Um, I'm afraid the masquerade is over. That's not original. My funny Valentine, that's not original witchcraft, you know, so he's singing, um, classics hits that have already been recorded and he's just trying to give his, um, own take on them. And he's really young. And so let's go back to who I was just talking about, Frank Sinatra, right? Not King Cole. These guys are a little bit older, right? And they they did start out young. Frank Sinatra was the equivalent of a Justin Bieber, um, whoever is like 
who the young girls are screaming for when they themselves are very young. Frank Sinatra came in very young and had the young women of the 19, probably even the late 1930s. I think Sinatra might have come in like 38, 39. And then definitely throughout the 40s, you know, he was young, 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 young. I don't even know if he was 20 when he hit the game. And but he grew, you know, into his career. So he's definitely um, more mature, though, by the time that the end of the the genre of music, you know, it's it's just past its peak. It's past its heyday. And. But let's go back. If you would have been a fan of that music, right? It's it's just like being a fan of Marvin Gaye, right? If you were a fan of Marvin from the beginning until the end, well, when Marvin's life and career ended, Marvin was this picture that I'm looking at right here, right? It's the 1980s. Marvin is 44. So, you know, you're established, you're mature, you're um, seasoned, you are a vet, you're a pro. And so it's cute. And that's, that's sweet when a young kid is going to try and come in and, you know, like remake your songs. But for my fans, like, just what's the motto? Only Marvin would do. So, you know, there were probably plenty of people of fans of that genre who was like, "Mm, Frank Sinatra will do. You know, and only Frank Sinatra and Nat King Cole will do. They weren't really receptive to a young newcomer coming along. And I think it was, it's those two things. Probably wouldn't have been receptive to an older newcomer coming along, but definitely, and for that style of music, right? And at that time in the cycle of that music, these people were not receptive to a young man, an unknown coming in, singing me songs that my idol has already recorded, you know, thank you. You know, (laughs) that was just the reception to the music. And it goes back to what I said as well, that, you know, that Marvin just kind of had some self consciousness about even trying to record it. I, I bless his heart. You know what I'm saying? And I love his heart. Like he had it in his heart that that's what he wanted to record. And, you know, he gave it a college try, but you also know that he just kind of felt this pressure that, oh my gosh, but who am I? I think that Marvin Gaye probably asked himself, like, who do I think that I am trying to sing this? And so that's kind of how he sang it, you know, and you can, you can feel it, especially, you know, today, right? Like, you might not have been able to feel it at the time, because you'd never heard him before. So you don't have anything to compare him to. But um, at this time, to go back and hear that you can tell you can hear it. Um, but please believe me, this is all connected to the shadow of your smile, the the title of this episode. Um, all right. So let's, let's move a little bit farther along. Mar- like I said, it's the form of doo-wop and it's the, the sound of, of, um, balloting, right? Balloting. He doesn't ever let it go. And so what I know, and again, you know, I'm not worried about giving you fact for fact, Wikipedia, biography on on this topic but there was this producer and I found a picture of him recently with Marvin and I have put it on my Pinterest page so please do bother to take a look at my my Pinterest page I didn't ever have a Pinterest account before I decided to make this Pinterest account because here was the struggle is real about you know images of Marvin Gaye images of copyrighted images right they're all over the place and they're beautiful and they're gorgeous. And oh my gosh, if I could just make a website of pictures of Marvin Gaye, I would totally do that. But of course you can't, you'll be sued. Um, but it's like Pinterest allows you to do that. Pinterest allows you to go out and find this wealth of imagery and you just put it in one spot that is still going to give credit to where it came from. So that's the purpose of that. And so I'm really doing a hard and a, a thorough job of trying to just uh, keep it really relevant and keep it really educational and keep it really tied to what I'm explaining here to show you what I'm talking about. So there was this guy, his name was Bobby Scott, and he was a producer. And he was a producer of that time. And he had these songs 
that Marvin um, encounters, I believe for the first time he encounters it in the late sixties. Now this is all stuff that we could Google um, and we could get the exact dates of, but the picture that I found was of Marvin looking very young. So that's, it is sixties. I can guarantee you it's sixties because a reference point that you can have in your mind, Marvin Gaye seventies is beard. Marvin Gaye, no beard is sixties. So this picture that I have of uh, Marvin and, and Bobby Scott, Marvin is looking very young. So I feel like the year 66 is coming to my mind. And I feel like perhaps that is a date that I would have, you know, encountered here in the Marvin Gaye collection, um, explaining that, but it was these arrangements, right? And that's the way that I, I know that it was worded is that there were these arrangements by Bobby Scott of these certain songs that Marvin Gaye was given that Marvin basically drafted and redrafted. And so basically he records, he re-records it. And he just kind of kept recording these songs over and over and over again um, for years that never got released. These things never got released at the time. I really do think, let's go back to the ballad deer aspect of Marvin's career. So he, he makes his first attempt with um, his very first album. It does, does not sell. Uh, the, the And it seems like according to those dates, that was June of 61. And then he doesn't get another album out until January of 63. So a year and a half goes by, right? And maybe it was a kind of a butting of the heads. You know, I think that what that, that year and a half span of time kind of tells me and just kind of based on Marvin's independent spirit with his music for sure, that he was not ready to just kind of throw in the towel. And I know that he wouldn't even necessarily want it to be explained in that extreme of a way, but it, it kind of was a resignation that Marvin made to give in and start recording the Motown sound. Okay. But there's nothing wrong with that because the Motown sound Marvin's music is like every single thing there. That's a huge part of the overall Motown sound. So, but it was, it was something that he had some resistance to. Right. So, um, it, that kind of lets me know the fact that he made one album and then a year and a half goes by before we get another album out of him. And then the sound of that album is pure Motown sound. There was some resistance to just deciding that that was the path that had to be taken. Um, probably some compromise, right? Like let's, let's call it like that. It was compromise. Um, but you know what it is? It's like, okay, again, Marvin is just always doing Marvin. So if he's going to compromise and he's going to have to make the Motown sound, oh, he's going to do it the best that he can do it. And thank you because that's the decade of the sixties. But what's going on in the background of that is I feel like I said again, 66, he's been given these arrangements by this guy, Bobby Scott, um, of these, um, jazz sounding songs. Now, I don't know if they were original songs or they were songs from the era, you know, decade or so back, um, that Marvin was just kind of rearranging and reapproaching. And I'm thinking of multiple songs when I say this, but I can, let's segue now into The Shadow of Your Smile because The Shadow of Your Smile is an actually interesting song in itself. That actually, that song is from the soundtrack of this movie from the 1960s, the late 1960s, 65, 66 of a movie with Elizabeth Taylor and her then husband, Richard Burton. And actually, I don't know, were they married yet? I think they might have been married at that point. So Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton have this very torrid, um, scandalous uh, marriage and love affair. And just, uh, you know, they're, they're Hollywood royalty. You know, they were the Angie and Brad of their time. Um, and to this day, like they're still legendary because Richard Burton just showered her with diamonds all the time. She had like this legendary to this day worldwide diamond collection where he was just always going around the world and buying her like the most expensive diamonds in the world. So that's
that's like their relationship. It was very rocky. It was very turbulent. He was an alcoholic. He got her very much into drinking heavily with him. And they just, again, they had a very turbulent marriage. They were married, kind of hot and heavy. They met each other on the, the set of a movie. I think that might have been Cleopatra that they met each other for the first time. And it was just kind of immediately sparks flew and they began this affair because I think possibly both of them were married at the time. I, I do believe for sure he was married at the time. She may have been married at the time. Uh, they started this affair, then they got married and kind of from there. Okay. So they made a series of movies with each other and kind of one of the yawn movies is I've seen this movie again. Like I said, I am also an old movie aficionado. Like it's, it's equal between that and, and Marvin in my life. So I know what I'm talking about when I'm saying these things. Um, I've seen the movie. It's a yawner. It's not a good movie. It, I was thinking about this movie the other day because I was thinking about recording this episode. It's not possible to explain the song without explaining that it came from this movie. And did I say the mo- the name of the movie is called Sandpiper? So it's this movie about, he's like a a reverend in a church, which is like, oh my gosh, Richard Burton, really? Like this flaming alcoholic guy in real life, (laughs) just this really bad boy in real life. He's playing some kind of man of the cloth. And they go, he and his wife moved to Big Sur in California, right? Like that iconic, huge rock in the ocean on the Pacific Ocean and just the the cliffs and stuff, that Big Sur. So they move there and Elizabeth Taylor is already living there and she's this real hippie woman and she comes across him and... Um, you know, he's open to talking to her because he's a man of the cloth and he thinks maybe she needs some spiritual help or whatever, but then she ends up seducing him and he has an affair with his wife. It's just this really kind of like over the top, uh, dramatic movie. And it's just kind of like, this is bad acting guys. Like it's a, it's a miss right here. This was a miss. Um, but of all of that, and I do believe that this song won an Academy Award. The shadow of your smile is, the soundtrack song um, for that movie. So that's where this song comes from. And it works its way into this collection of arrangements that Bobby Scott and Marvin Gaye are working on. Pro- that's probably why I thought the year 66 comes to mind, because let's say that movie came out in 65 and then 66, Marvin's given the arrangement and he's approaching the song. So he records it in this way that is just very unique, right? And of course, that's always what's going to be the case with a Marvin take on something. It's just very unique. Back to that first album, when I was reading that list of songs, it was like, oh, that was already recorded. That was already recorded. But when I, and I've heard that album, when I listen to those songs, they don't really sound like the previous versions of them that you have heard. So um, The Shadow of Your Smile it is very important to point out the version of it that we receive on the Marvin Gaye collection disc for the Balladier track 15 is the version that I'm talking about because as I mentioned, Marvin like starts to record these songs when he first gets his hands on them and he just records them over and over and over again throughout the years. He has so many versions of himself recording these same songs. And I believe that it's towards the seventies that this version of these, there's a handful of songs on this Marvin Gaye collection disc four that are these Bobby Scott arrangements. This disc is consisting of songs from the 60s that Marvin recorded in that balladaire style, along with these, I believe, just from the 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 sound of the maturity of Marvin's voice uh, and his ability to deliver his song. Uh, it's telling me they're more 1970s than that earlier time frame. So he is just recording and recording and recording these songs over and over again. But I can tell you what changed it up. And I do believe why it is the versions that we have here. The change is he's met Janice. And 
I, I don't know where I'm recalling this information from in my mind right now. I believe it's part from Marvin's biography by David Ritz, which is a semi autobiographical book. It's important for me to point that out too, because like I said previously, I have some issues with David Ritz, period. And I'll say that right now what the issue is. It's that this man, David Ritz, had the nerve to really need to make a big, huge deal about claiming that he basically is the one that wrote Marvin's song, Sexual Healing. Okay. Um, I have a really huge issue with just being able to swallow that pill. And just from my perspective right now, I don't really give an F about the ins and outs of that entire situation. And like, I do believe that he pressed it so hard that he took it to court. And I do believe at the end, he was awarded some type of compensation and credits for it. But it's just like, dudes, you know what I'm explaining to you about the whole entire thing. And we'll continue to explore very deeply. It's like, really dude, um, you probably were a contributor and you probably helped it out, but you really have it twisted and you have yourself confused and you don't understand who you kind of really are and who Marvin Gaye really is. If you kind of feel the need to kind of take all the credit, it's like, it's not what happened and I didn't even need to be there to know that. So that's my issue with him. Um, my issue, another issue that I have with David Ritz is that for whatever reason, he kind of became regarded as like the authority on Marvin. And so throughout my journey of learning Marvin's music, um, I get my new discs. I get my new discs all the time, right? They're the brand new release discs because this disc has never been pressed onto disc before. It was made in an album and then it's been 15 years since now they're around to releasing this album on disc. I get these things. I'm totally excited. I rip them open and there's always these little books inside, right? Your liner notes. And so I made mistakes in those years of getting my brand new music where I would start to read before I would start to listen. And what I was reading a lot of the time, I would kind of get to the end of it and I would see, oh, this shit was just written by David Ritz. And David Ritz's take on Marvin's music sometimes is totally 100% off. And so I would, you know, I don't know if it's even something that people would encounter in this day and age as you would be getting your hands on, on Marvin music. But if I could, you know, spare anybody, it would be like, do not read liner notes before you just listen to the music. You need to absorb the music and you need to process it on your own. You need to form your own opinion. You don't need to have, um, a negative impression in your mind about it already. And that that's what I would say that David Ritz just kind of gave me a lot of is just this negative life energy about his takes on Marvin's songs. And so when then I would first hear the song, I would already kind of have this muddled uh, dialogue that had been already kind of crap talked about the song. And it would just kind of get in my way, you know? And so that's another thing that I just want to kind of really point out will never be an element of, uh, you know, this series is me talking any kind of crap about Marvin. I'm not ever going to go into any salacious details. I'm not going to touch on things that are touched on a lot of the times. It's not important and it's not a part of Marvin's soul. You know what I'm saying? Like that is what I definitely think that we can focus on is what we get to learn about Marvin's soul through listening to this music. And there's nothing negative about that. So that will never be a part of what is explained or discussed or explored in this series. Um, but I was talking about David Ritz, right? <laughs> I was talking about um, these songs. Oh, so that at some point, possibly written by David Ritz, um, it was explained that in the 70s, once Marvin had met Jan, and he now had this refreshed, romantic, real life inspiration, he reapproached recording these songs. And I believe it's from Janice's um, autobiography. She explained how Marvin would actually just have her in the studio with him. And he'd have her outside of the booth. He'd get into the booth and he would just tell her it was like her job. He's like, all right, I'm getting in here to record this music right now. And what I just need you to do is sit here so that I can see you and I'm going to sing to you. And that was her job. She was to be in the studio to be sung to. And as he was able to see her and I like, he really needed to see her. So as he was able to see her, he was able to 
create these different takes on the songs. And so it is definitely the versions that are here on the Marvin Gaye Collection Disc 4 that are the deepest versions of these songs. So I, I think I've briefly stated this, but I will clarify it right now. There are different versions of these songs that are available. And if you go onto your Spotify or you go onto your streaming services and you go onto Google and you can find an audio version of these songs, if you're not getting it from the Marvin Gaye collection, disc four, you're not hearing, in my opinion, I don't, I'm not even going to say the right version of the song. I, I don't want to say it, but you're not hearing the version of the song that I'm talking about. Okay. You're not hearing the version of the song that is what I first heard and what first is where I'm going to just very quickly tie in how I explained the reason why I was going to record this issue or episode. Um, so here's my personal take and um, association to the song. So I'm 14. I'm up in North Dakota, um, which if you would know who I am, right? I've just told you that before I'm black <laughs> was in this small town in North Dakota. Um, you know, my, my experience has been multiracial. So I was raised in a multiracial home. And part of that multiracialness was that, you know, we had relatives in North Dakota, a very small, um, what would the, like Norwegian is, is really the, the ethnicity, uh, makeup up there that, that Scandinavian, right? The Scandinavian countries. So, you know, I am spending a lot of time in my youth in these, um, Scandinavian <laughs> influenced, uh, areas. And so, you know, I just had a, a multicultural experience growing up, but, um, we were up there this summer when I was 14 and this was on the heels of me losing my appendix, which was one week after my next door neighbor had died, right? She had been pregnant with her second child and they were just the most friendly, adorable couple. And they were single when we first moved in next to them. They lived there before we did. And so we moved in and they didn't have children yet. And so they were just this young, happy couple. And they were so friendly. They would always talk to my, my, um, multicultural mom and, and, and dad and just so friendly. It was like, it was not a factor to them and just all, and they were multicultural themselves, actually, when I just now am envisioning them. So they were just always so friendly. They would just always talk to where like this woman was just so gregarious and just so friendly and just so, she just had this aura about her to where it literally happened that one time myself and my youngest sister went over just to go, my sister to play with her much younger little girl. Her little girl was almost two and my sister had to have been about five or six and I was 13 and the lady had just invited us over to just, and so I remember when we got there, cause I was kind of feeling like I, she had asked me and I didn't want to say no, you know, to like seem rude, but it was at the same time, I was kind of thinking like, what am I going to go talk to this lady about? You know what I mean? I was a 13 year old girl. Um, so I went though with my little sister and my little sister took off with a little two year old, which in that in itself was also kind of interesting, but my sister was open to it. You know, she knew she was just playing with a little baby. And so she, she played with the baby and I sat in the living room just talking to my neighbor and she was just awesome, dude. She was just like, you know who she really was. She was like a cool aunt. You know what I'm saying? Like, she, cause she wasn't as old as my parents. Um, so she, and you know, it, it didn't totally feel awkward trying to talk to her. Um, cause I remember once I got there and then my sister and her little girl went off, then it was just me and this lady, but she did want to talk to me. And so she was just like, so tell me the scoop. She's like, what's the scoop? And so then we just had this one-on-one -on -one conversation and she just really was that type of person. Like she just was just this really beautiful spirited person. And so 
then, and at that time, at that time she was pregnant. I do remember because a part of what I was asking her is like, what was she expecting? Like, what, how was she preparing herself to have to deal with two babies under two in diapers? I remember that's exactly the way I asked her. Cause I just was like, wow, that's gotta be a handful. Um, because my sister and I are nine years apart. So it was not such a handful when she came along. I was available to help out in a lot of ways. So I just, I had not, you know, kind of firsthand experience somebody uh, taking on that much parental responsibility, right? Like just, and that was, that's all I could think of to just kind of like get inside of her head. I wanted to see how she was preparing to have to deal with that. It just seemed like that was going to be a, a whole lot to have to handle. And I remember she was just kind of, you know, she knew she was taking on a lot, but she was ready for it. She just kind of explained, she was like, she was just going to have to do it. It was just going to be you know, what it was for a little while and that it wouldn't be that circumstance that she would have two babies in diapers forever, you know, that she knew she was working on potty training her little girl right there. Um, So that was that, you know, but that was just my little personal experience, just kind of having tea (laughs) with my next door neighbor. And so then the last time that I saw her was, I feel like a couple of months after that, because she wasn't very far along. I, well, she might've been about six months along when we were there at her house like that. But then the next time I saw her was like days before she had the baby. And I just remember she was outside. We were, it was summertime, right? It was June. And, um, she was walking, right? Because that's what women do when they're very close to having their babies and they want to encourage their babies. They go walking. We lived on this very, very steep hill, that was just like the biggest characteristic to our block was that the hill was just so steep. And so she was out this one summer night, uh, sun was still shining. So it was hot and it was a hot day. It was like a 90 degree day, but she was out with her family. It was her, um, mom and her brother and her, I feel like maybe her dad too. And she was there and, um, I just remembered she seemed really agitated. She was just kind of really, um, not herself. That is what I will say. Like why I had such a strong reaction to the way she was coming across is that it was not herself. She was not herself. She was so agitated and that just wasn't who she was. And I just kind of remembered having this, a little bit of a judgment look at her, um, of like, thinking, you know, I will just point this out about myself when I was that age. And I think maybe I think teenagers are kind of like that. You start to become very critical of adults, right? Like just everything about the adults, especially the ones around you kind of become just annoying as hell because you're comparing yourself as you're kind of on the brink of getting to that level yourself. And you're just like kind of judging the things about them that you don't want to be and do yourself. And maybe I shouldn't generalize that, but that's who I was as a teenager. Okay. (laughs) When I was observing my next door neighbor like that, so agitated, these little judgments started to come through. These little teenage judgments started to come through of like, why is she acting like that? Because she's so close to being able to have this baby. Like it's just within days now, like soon enough, she's going to be out of this, um, misery that she's in. You know, there's no reason to be agitated. Like that was my judgment. So that was the, and that was the last time I saw her. Um, and I just knew I was like within days, the baby's going to be here. So, you know, she'll be feeling better soon. And so then it was this one day, a week or more later, uh, I was in the kitchen actually, this was one of the very first times that I ever did this. I was making dinner for the family. I had grabbed this cookbook and I was making us chicken fajitas. Um, and I was just going through following this recipe, but I was actually at the stove and I was full on cooking. Um, and this was like, this was one of the first time full on cooking that I was making the meal for the family that day because my mom and dad were out in the backyard in their garden. And I explained earlier, we had a quarter acre backyard. So we had like two huge gardens, um, just all kinds of vegetables. So, and they were out in the garden that was in the very, very back of our yard up against our back fence. So they were way, way out in the backyard and they were working hard. They had been out there all day when they would be working in our garden. It would be like what they were doing for the day. So they had been out working in the garden 
And I knew that like, it was getting to be dinner time and I should probably just fix something for us if we were going to eat, you know, something decent. So I just started making us these chicken fajitas. My sisters were off playing. I'm in the kitchen and I'm making this food. And so I, I happened to observe that uh, the next door neighbor husband is out in the backyard with my mom and dad. And I was like, oh, OK, baby's here. He's coming to let him know that. And so they had come from all the way out in the garden to kind of meet him halfway. They were standing out in the middle of our yard. We had this clothesline um, kind of in the middle of our yard and they were standing at the edge of the clothesline. And I could kind of see him. I feel like he was facing me and my parents uh, were, you know, had their backs to me. And they were standing there and they were having a conversation and it was a serious conversation. It was not a happy I'm here to spread the beautiful news that my baby has just been born conversation because it was a longer conversation and I could tell it was a heavy conversation. And the longer that it was going on, I could tell I am a very um, intuitive person. I'm watching this conversation and it's way away from me. There's no way possible. I'm not hearing any dialogue. But a few seconds beyond me being able to tell that he wasn't just there to announce that his baby was born, I could tell that somebody had died. And I immediately went to thinking that baby had died. So I'm just, I'm sitting, I'm actually seeing this in my mind right now. I'm seeing myself standing at the kitchen sink, looking out our window that was over the kitchen sink, just observing these adults having this conversation. And immediately I knew somebody had died and wow, I was like, wow, that baby died. The baby died. And I was just like, immediately, I always kind of just try. And when it comes to death, I try and get positivity of carrying on out of it because that is what we have to do and so immediately my thought process was that they would be able to have more babies they were young they were young and this was tragic but they would be able to have more babies like that was just immediately my mind needed to grasp that. And so I stood there. I, I now was into this conversation too, even though I, I couldn't hear it. And so I just stood there and I made sure, you know, out of respect to be out of view. You know what I mean? It was like I was eavesdropping, but I didn't want to be disrespectful about it. I just knew something major and heavy was being shared and I couldn't take my eyes off of it. Right. So in a few more seconds, um, our neighbor was walking away and he was heavy and he was just, he just walked away and my parents still stood right where they were. And it wasn't much longer. My stepmom just kind of crumbled just right where she was. She just kind of crumbled down onto the cement. We had this, it was a little cement patch, um, the end of a little sidewalk up to our, you know, clothesline and then the little, a little patch of cement. And she just kind of collapsed down on to that cement. And I could tell she was sobbing. I could see her body like sobbing. And I was just like, wow. I, it, her reaction was so um, intense that I just, I, I, wasn't trying to seem cold, but I, I couldn't really understand her crying like that for the loss of the baby. It, it just all of a sudden was not matching that it must have been the baby that had died. And so then I think I was the one that walked out to them. And then I learned that it was our neighbor was the one that had died. And, um, like I have said, I'm going to try and keep it together here. (sighs) 
to this day. You know, it is the saddest thing that happened to someone else that you know in real life, right? It just, that was just the most devastating thing. And then I came across this song. And um, it was just no more than, it wasn't even two months after our beautiful neighbor had passed away. And it is the message of the song that just very much captured the sadness of that situation. Because I would feel like the message of this song as, is as if someone has died. Um, it is delicate. It is beautiful. It is respectful. It was totally appropriate, totally homage to my neighbor. And um, yeah, that's my personal take on that song. That is my connection, my experience, my interpretation of that song, my connection to it. So The Shadow of Your Smile, the uh, Marvin Gaye Collection Disc 4 Ballad Deer version of the song, it does not match other versions of the song that you may be able to find and stream online. I, I've heard the multiple versions of the song. They don't match what is captured in, in here. Um, and, and what is captured in here was a beautiful um, accompaniment and companion for me getting through that situation. All right, folks, that's it for this episode. Thank you for listening. Stay tuned for our next songs. <laughs>